Paul is passionate about creating healthier forests for many generations to enjoy and helping people learn that they can much better coexist with wildfires. So please enjoy the air of megafires. <coughs> Sleepy Hollow Fire started in Chelan County Fire District 6's area. Initially there was probably about, I guess, 12 primary residents that were threatened. We had damage to two different engines. It was some very heroic actions over there. And Mother Nature gave us a battle that we could hold our own. And it was an active fire battle in Sleepy Hollow. Conditions of what happened over in Broadview uh, were not the same. The speed at which it moved down was not anticipated. The winds were driving the embers totally sideways and it caught a lot of people off guard. No one had that in their slide carousel of previous fire behavior. The fuel loading that we had in a ravine right below the homes brought a wall of flame that was up and over those homes that even if we had pre-positioned resources all along there, we wouldn't have had them in front of that wall of flame. We have to take into consideration the defensible space that's around the home, the condition of the home, egress out of there. Human lives are always more important than analysis. At one point I had radio traffic from our dispatch center saying they're getting reports of a structure fire at such and such a location. And my response was, Rurocom, I'm looking at eight homes burning right now. These houses that are on fire have a tremendous amount of fuel load on them. And it's carrying the sparks and embers down to the warehouse district and then we get the report of uh, fire starting up behind the The embers spread to three different warehouse areas down there. Extraordinary actions were taken. We had them working for hours in 100 plus degree temperature. There was a couple people that had IVs started, rehydrated that way and put back out on the line. There was reports of embers the size of a half dollar from landing over a mile away. I've said to several people, but by the grace of God, we didn't have another fire start up in South Wenatchee or over in East Wenatchee. It was coming into number one canyon. We were going to have an active firefight um, that next morning as soon as the sun came up. Instead, we had rain. We lost 30 structures, and I take that very personally. I also know that if it wasn't for the actions of the firefighters, the citizens of this community, the residents that were assisting, we would have potentially lost hundreds <coughs> more. Thank you for having us here this evening. I'm really glad you're here. I'm Paul Hesberg, and this was my hometown of Wenatchee, Washington, on June 29th, 2015, the day after the Sleepy Hollow fire. As Chief Burnett said, we dodged a bullet in North Central Washington. Rain actually put out our fire the morning of the second day. Over the course of the next hour, I'm going to explain how we got into this so-called era of megafires, and I'm going to talk about some concrete things that we can do about it. To leave with one idea. I want you to leave with the notion that we all can and we all must learn to live another way with wildfires. Sleepy Hollow, it was a pretty small fire. It burned about 3,000 acres. You can see that orange blob there west of Wenatchee. In 2014 and 2015, our neighbors to the north, they experienced even larger and more destructive wildfires. You can see the 2014 fires there in gray. Several of these got bigger than 100,000 acres. 
and that's what we call a mega fire. The 2015 fires are shown next to them in orange, and you can see that some of these were mega fires too. For us, 2014 and 2015 were back to back record setting wildfire years in the state of Washington. But it just isn't Washington alone, is it? Other areas of the West are experiencing this similar increased frequency of larger and more destructive fires. This is a map, in fact, of fires that are recorded throughout the inland Northwest, and this is just the last 30 years. In this next graph, you can see the blue line shows what it would look like if there wasn't any change from year to year and the annual area burned. The upward trend of actual acres burned is pretty sobering, isn't it? It's actually exponential, it's accelerating. And the data lost on structures, uh, structures lost to wildfires is equally <coughs> sobering. This map shows structures that were lost to wildfires just between the period 1999 and 2016. And so what you're looking at is the larger and the darker the dot, the more structures are being lost in an individual fire. Some of these areas lost upwards of 3,000 structures in a single wildfire. There are structures, these are people's homes, garages, barns, cabins, sheds, outbuildings. Some people say as we travel around, you know, I really haven't been affected by this issue. But I'd like to suggest to you tonight that as taxpayers, this should concern all of us. In 2016, 57% of the entire Forest Service budget went toward just fighting fires. And that's up by 40% from just 17% of the budget only 25 years ago. That's not even the true cost of today's wildfires. Take a look. When it comes to how much we're spending on wildfires, most people simply count the cost of fighting them. And it is true that over the last two decades, the amount we've spent on fire suppression has increased exponentially. In 2015, we spent a record-breaking $2.1 billion on suppression. But while this number is something to be concerned about, it's only part of the story. A wildfire's economic impact can be far-reaching. On average, this is how much we spend on suppression. And this is how much we spend on rebuilding damaged or destroyed structures. Add to that the cost of restoring vital infrastructure, factor in the resulting loss of business revenue and lowered property values, and the true economic impact of a wildfire is on average 24 times the amount spent on suppression. So what is the real total cost of wildfires in record-breaking 2015? $2.1 billion? No, more like $50 billion. And that truly is something to be concerned about. $50 billion with a B in 2015. I'd like to suggest that megafires affect families and communities across our land each year and they impact every taxpayer. I've spent my career studying Western landscapes and I'd like to suggest that the science is getting pretty clear. If we don't change some of our fire management habits, we're going to lose many more of these beloved landscapes, and some won't recover in our lifetime, or our kids' lifetime, or now my five grandkids' lifetime. If you're like me, this Western landscape is why my family and I live here. We love this landscape. We work in it. We play in it. We depend upon it for our way of life. As a father and a scientist, I'm deeply concerned about what we're leaving behind for our kids. There's a lot at stake here. It's time we all confront some tough truths about wildfire and come to understand that we can learn to better live with wildfire and change how some of them come to our forests, our homes, and our cities. I want to share some imagery of forests of the interior west with you. Let's see what you think. It's beautiful, isn't it? Pristine. It's where we go to refuel. 
growing up, I think we learned that forests that look like these are the picture of healthy landscapes. But in fact, many of these forests are a ticking time bomb and they're ready to burn big and hot, some of them bigger and hotter than usual. And what's more, these forests don't look anything like the ones that we inherited. Thankfully, panoramic photos like these were taken from thousands of western fire lookouts and mountaintops in the 1930s by Bill Osborne and company, and they show a fair approximation of the landscapes that we actually inherited. And the best word to describe these forests of old is Apache. The historical landscape was an ever-evolving patchwork of open and closed canopy forests of all ages and three sizes. And there was so much evidence of fire on that landscape. And most of the fires were pretty small by today's standards. And it's important to understand that across this landscape, a good portion of it was open in meadows and in open forests. And it was the meadows and the grassy understories of those open forests that spread many of the historical fires. And there were other forces at work, too, shaping the patchiness of this forest. For example, topography, whether it's on a north or a south facing slope, up on a ridge top or down in a valley bottom. Elevation, how far up the mountain it is, weather, how much snow and rain, sunlight and warmth up place gets. These things all worked together, along with fire, to shape the way the forest grew. And in turn, the way the forest grew shaped the way fire could behave on the landscape. There was a crosstalk a cross-connection between the patterns of the forests and the processes. You can see that in dry forests, trees were open ground and fairly far apart, and fires were pretty frequent here. And when they occurred, they were typically not severe. But further up the mountain, in the moist and the cold forest, trees were denser, fires were less frequent, and when they occurred, they were often more severe. These different forest types the environments they grew in and fire severity all worked together to create these patchworks. And there was so much power in the patchwork itself. It provided a natural mechanism to resist fire's future spread across the landscape. A good way to think of it is that once a patch of forest burned, it helped to prevent later fires from spreading for a time. The burned patches in the patchwork help the rest of the forest landscape to actually deforest. We now understand that fire was the primary disturbance shaping our western landscapes. Everything that lives in the woods and on the range depends on working out a life story with fire in it. Over thousands of years, native plants and animals, they've adapted to fire in some need fire to survive. For example, ponderosa pine has this lovely thick bark that protects it from the heat of frequent fire, sometimes every 5, 10, 15 years, and then this can go on for centuries. But it actually needs the mineral soils that are exposed by fires for its seeds to germinate. Balsam root, we love this showy flower in the spring, but it's got this amazing deep taproot, so it easily Resprouts time and again after it's been singed by fires. Woodpeckers of all stripes use burn snags to build their nests and raise their young. And after the woodpeckers move out and fledge their young, dozens of other birds and small mammals will reuse the cavities that were excavated by the woodpeckers, and they'll raise and fledge their young there too. Landslides after fires bring boulders trees, root lots, rocks, and soil often violently down the slope. And then rivers in the spring flood sort these materials to build deep pools and spawning gravels which form essential fish habitats. Do you think of native fish as adapted to the fire regime and its rhythms? They are. Ceanothus resprouts after fires and deer feed on the new shoots. Developing shrubs protect burned hill slopes from chronic erosion, and they leak nitrogen to other plants establishing after fires nearby. Lodgepole pine cones, they open after fires. Tiny resin droplets seals each cone scale until a fire's heat melts that resin, and then the cones can open, 
seeds can fall to the ground and seedlings can birth for. For millennia, it was wildfires maintaining native plants and animals and this diverse patch of landscape. Now let's add humans to the mix. For 10,000 years, American Indians lived on this landscape and they intentionally burned it. They burned it a lot. They figured out that they could use fire to burn meadows and thin certain kinds of forests so they could grow more food and they could improve graves for the deer and the bison and the elk. They figured out that intentionally red spring and fall fires helped them to often avoid severe summer fires. And we now know that the resulting landscape was patchy and evidence suggests that the forests that they burned had even fewer trees than would have occurred under the natural fire regime due to their frequent intentional burning. And if you know your history, in the 1850s, American Indians were sadly marshaled onto reservations and much of their wisdom and experience as being a culture of burners was temporarily lost. But their efforts underway now throughout the West to recapture much of that wisdom. So, how do we go from a diverse and patchy forest to one that's dense and later, which is 150 years? It starts with the settlement of the West, beginning in earnest in the mid 1800s. By the 1880s, livestock raising was in high gear. The cattle and sheep, now they ate the grasses, which had been the conveyor belt for spreading many of the historical fires. And this prevented frequent fires from thinning understory trees and burning them in the wood. And then came roads and railroads. And if you think about it, they would act as very potent fire breaks, interrupting the flow of wildfires naturally across the landscape. Think of tens of thousands of miles crisscrossing that landscape. And then something happened that caused a sudden pivot in our society. It was the size of the state of Connecticut. We called it the Big Bird. It stretched from eastern Washington to western Montana. And it gobbled up three million acres, several towns, and killed 87 people. Most of them were firefighters. Because of this big burn, wildfires suddenly became public enemy number one. And this event would shift how we would view fire in this country for the next 100 years or more. The Forest Service was five years old at that time, and they were suddenly tasked with putting out all fires on 193 million acres of public land. And along with their partner agencies, they took this responsibility very seriously. And they developed an unequal capability of putting out fires, in fact, at least 95% of them every year. Let's take a look at the results of those suppression efforts. This graph shows annual acres burned going back to 1920. By 1935, in the 10 a.m. rule, fire suppression efforts had reduced acres burned annually, and they were able to hold fires at bay for a period of about 50 years. So think from about 1935 to about 1985. And at that point, fuel built up in more frequently extreme fire weather stymied more and more efforts to douse some of these fires. And annual acres burned increased again to levels that looked just like those before the advent of fire suppression. And our climate change research has showed us that this period from 1935 to 1985 was also a period of relatively cool and moist climate, and it made our suppression efforts look really amazing. <laughs> so from 1934 on, it would become fire suppression and now wildfire that would become the prime shaper of our forest. And this would have effects that we would come to understand for decades to come. In addition to this firefighting, the Forest Service managed timber harvesting and domestic livestock grazing on these public lands. And by 1940s and World War II, the timber industry was going strong in the West, and Congress appropriated larger sums each year for the Forest Service to
to provide wood for a growing nation. And the nation was growing fast. And if you think about it, the logging removed the big and the old trees. And these were survivors of centuries of repeated fires. And what happened? Small, thin bark, shade loving trees, and the floating gas. And our forest became dense. The trees so layered and close together that they could touch each other. So fires were unintentionally blocked by roads and railroads. Intentional Indian burning had stopped. Cattle and sheep ate the grasses, which had been the conveyor belt for fires. You add to that fire suppression, the harvest of large trees, and the forest fills in under all of those influences. And collectively, these factors created what I like to call the current epidemic of trees. More trees than the landscape can support with its fire regime. So now when you compare what forests looked like 100 years <coughs> ago and today, well, I find the change remarkable. Notice how that patchwork is filled in. Dry south slopes are now covered with trees. A patchwork once sculpted most often by small and mid-sized fire is filled in. Can you see the blanket of trees? Let's go down on the ground now and see some of these forests up close, shall we? <coughs> We're standing in a dry mix conifer forest. This particular area has received fire fairly frequently, and I want to show you, this is what a healthy dry mix conifer forest looks like. If a fire comes through here, it's going to stay on the ground, burning through grasses, dried grasses, and twigs and branches and that sort of thing. And it's going to have difficulty getting up into the crown. <coughs> this is a very different looking mixed conifer stand. It hasn't seen fire in close to 100 years. One of the things you can see when you walk into a forest like this that's been without fire is the old bones, the old structure of the large trees that used to occupy the forest. And then you can see the thicket of small and medium-sized trees that have grown up in the absence of fire. This is pretty clear and easy going, isn't it? Watch your eyes. <laughs> Boy, this will go up hot. This is an example of the epidemic of trees that has occurred throughout the western United States, especially in mixed conifer forests. This patch of forest is really hurting. Feels on the ground. Feel ladder, dead trees. So this is what we call a fuel ladder. A fuel ladder is trees of all sizes and ages that connect the fuels on the forest floor to the canopies of large trees. So as a fire is moving up this hill, it'll move into the lower branches of that fuel ladder, and the fire will torch out into those larger trees. And that's why it functions as a ladder. This ponderosa pine is in perfect shape after all the fires in its history. But this Douglas fir next to it's gonna kill it. You know, everywhere you look in this patch of forest, you can see all the rules of a frequent fire regime are broken. Fire coming anywhere on this hillside is going to crown out and take out the big trees. And that's just not the way it used to work. The West has more trees than ever and is highly flammable. And people are moving into these woods in ever greater numbers. Seems a bit crazy, doesn't it? Folks are moving into these forests in greater numbers, and they're creating what we call a rapidly expanding wildland urban interface, or WUI for short. <laughs> Don't you love that? <laughs> Homes in the WUI, they're difficult to defend, and most firefighting dollars actually go to protecting homes, not forests. In a good year, it's just 50% of the total suppression dollars. But in a 
bad year, it's more like 95% of the suppression effort. And all too often, it's too and it's too late. Where developments are large, the per-home defense costs, they run in the tens of thousands of dollars. But where homes are isolated, the per-home defense costs, they often exceed the value of the houses. And as you would imagine, firefighter and citizen safety is always going to be job one, right? But it's us who continue to build our homes where they're often most difficult to defend. In fact, two recent studies show that more than 60% of all new housing starts are being built in this flammable and dangerous mess. But there's actually good news, too. Headwaters Economics reports that 84% of the area that still could become wooey is undeveloped. And that means that communities like mine in the Wenatchee Valley that want to manage their wildfire issue, they still mostly have options. But the time for us to decide on where we're going to build, what we're going to build with, separating our roads in and out of those developments and defensible neighborhood planning is well before the wildfires. Once the wildfires are roaring, well, it's too late often. Continued development in the wildland urban interface is putting really serious pressure on our firefighters too. Not just the wildland folks, but also our structure firefighters. And it's critical that you and I understand that as homeowners, we have very significant responsibility in all of this. Our county as a whole is a pretty big ag county. So the only place to go for development is on the hillside. And when you move further out in the wildland, there comes a point where that growth comes with a lot of risk. Roads are steeper. Sage, shrub step type of fuels, or you get into the timber. Fires are different now. You could phrase it as a disaster waiting to happen. Folks think, I'm paying taxes for fire, so therefore those folks should protect me from fire. And that's just not the case. It's actually the homeowner's responsibility to make sure that they give us an opportunity to try to, to help save their house in the event of a fire. My first priority is to my firefighters and their families take a drive, go up and take a look at the steepness of the slope, look at the steepness of the roads, uh, the fuel type that's around that subdevelopment. I also look at structures, so if there is a fire there, I got an idea what we may be up against. Are there shrubbery or trees or any of that type of thing right up against the house? <coughs> Limbs overhanging the house. Are they cleaning their gutters? Are they cleaning their roofs if they have pine trees, fir trees? What type of roofing do they have? How much decking do they have? What's the decking made out of? If they have a wood stove or a fireplace, where are they putting their wood? The rule of thumb is 30 feet around your structure, lean, mean, and green. We don't want you to lose your structure. We don't want you to lose all of those belongings inside your structure. That's the last thing we want to do. They have to understand that it is a partnership and their responsibility is their piece of property. It's pretty clear we have a lot of work to do in the interface around Wenatchee, huh? But it isn't just us, is it? A lot of cities around the West look like, just like us. I want to shift gears now and introduce a compounding issue of some real significance. And a lot of recent press about the importance of these increasingly hotter drier summits. Well, this more severe fire weather is having a huge effect on current megafires. And it's critical that we all understand that these effects won't just continue, but they're going to continue to worsen. I want to use as an example Fort McMurray, Alberta. They experienced the largest wildfire in their history in May of 2016. And for geographic reference, that's a thousand miles north of my hometown of Wenatchee in boreal forests that are halfway to the Arctic Circle in May. 
That fire destroyed more than 2,400 homes. It displaced over 100,000 people. Many of them still don't have homes. It burned one and a half million acres, most of those acres in a handful of days. Well, the major news networks, they attributed this fire to warmer winter temperatures and earlier spring and a hotter, drier, and windier summer. And they were right. To get a better understanding of how this changing climate and weather is playing a role in our megafires, we visited a friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Dave Peterson. He's a climatologist with Forest Service Research and the University of Washington. Let's see what he has to say. So of course we know that when we have hotter and drier weather, we're going to get more fire. So that's not rocket science. But what we're seeing is a potentially permanent change in our weather patterns to drier summers, longer fire seasons, and just having fire become a more prominent player across the landscape. When I sit down at my desk and I actually look at the data, it kind of hits me in the face. There are some things changing very quickly. We have about 100 years of fire history data in the Western United States. And it's very easy to develop a statistical relationship between climate and fire occurrence. When we project those relationships into the future, by about mid-century, we end up getting two to three times more fire per year in eastern Washington and in other areas around the Intermountain West where dry forests exist. That's a tremendous change ecologically and it's going to be a tremendous change also in terms of the impacts on human communities. So we're going to have a long adjustment as we go through this period of increased fire. And the main thing that we need to be aware of is a lot of our forests have not experienced fire for many decades. That means we have a lot of fuel buildup, and that means when fires do occur, they're going to be intense, they're going to be crown fires, and they'll probably cover a lot of area because it's very difficult to suppress those kinds of fire. At some point later in the 21st century, we may catch up with what I call the fire debt, but at least in the near term, we can probably expect to have a lot more of these high intensity, large fires. We need a shift in attitude from the concept of resisting fire to living with fire, because it is part of our environment. So the contribution of a hotter, drier, and now windier climate is real. And even some of the most conservative forecasts are pretty dire. For example, fire seasons are 40 to 80 days longer than they were just 50 years ago. What does that mean? In the worst years, that's a doubling of the fire season. That's a lot of increased exposure to fire. These warmer temperatures and larger fires are a reality for the foreseeable future. But even though fires are going to be larger in coming years, we don't need to live with the existing fuel conditions. We have options and we have tools that we can apply. Fire severity is largely driven by dead fuels on the ground, winds interacting with the steepness of the slope, and the density and layering of tree canopies. If we deal with these fuels responsibly and in a manner consistent with the natural fire regime, we can influence the severity of many of these wildfires. In effect, we can restore some of that power of the patchwork. So let's put this all together. For just 150 years, the patchwork that we once had is gone, and we have a dense carpet of forest. Because trees are growing close together now, and tree species and sizes and ages are pretty similar across large areas, fires not only pass easily from acre to acre and tree to tree, but so do, do diseases and insects. And they're killing or they're reducing the vitality of large areas of forest. After a century without fire, 
The buildup of fuels on the forest floor is in many places at powder keg levels. More extreme fire weather, fire seasons are getting longer, and acres burned since 2000 will double or triple in the next 30 years. And we're building houses right in the middle of this. And that's special. So when we do get a fire, large areas can literally go up and smoke. Forest burning at these large scales can be a real problem for forests, too. Some of these areas, they get stuck in a rut. You see, historical fires left islands of trees scattered throughout to reseed the new forest. Currently, fires are often severe enough that they're killing many of these islands, or firefighters are burning them out to avoid additional fire spotting. So large burned areas, they can become perpetual meadows or shrub fields that can carry fire again and again and again. And this can delay the return of forests for decades to centuries. Let's take another look at the forests I showed you in the beginning. How do you feel about them now? <laughs> Well, frankly, these conditions, they scare the daylights out of me. What's to be done? Simply put, I would suggest we need to restore that former power of the patchwork. And we have tools and we have know-how to do this. In fact, there are a lot of smart folks working on this problem, and they've come up with a solid strategy. It's called the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy. Could have come up with a better name, huh? <laughs> but it's a good strategy and identifies <coughs> three areas that need our support. The first one is to create resilient landscapes around our communities. What does that mean? We change the way fire and fire behavior can come to our communities. The second is to create and maintain fire adapted communities. It means we get our communities ready for fire before the fires come. And the third is to maintain a safe and effective wildfire response. We put fires out when they're going to be big and nasty, but when they're working under moderate weather conditions and fuel conditions, we let them do some work. Let's take a moment to break this down so we can better understand that we have individual roles to play. The first leg of this tool is to create those resilient landscapes. And that means we work to change the way wildfires arrive at our homes and our communities. We can recreate landscapes that can tolerate fires that are more typical for the forest type, where the patchwork is restored and the landscape can more often than not self-regulate fire growth and fire severity. But to get there, we're going to need a lot of tools. Let's take a look at a few of them. One clear choice involves the use of prescribed burning. It's an extremely helpful tool. We used to do a lot more of it. Prescribed fire is an extremely important tool for managing fire dependent ecosystems. So after a couple of years, I uh, discovered the prescribed fire councils in the southeastern United States where they've been very, very successful in implementing prescribed burning. And we imported that idea here to North Central Washington, established the North Central Washington Prescribed Fire Council. In regions where the communities have embraced prescribed fire, we have seen reduced fire behavior, more healthy fire dependent wildlife habitat, and more easily control wildfires when, when wildfires do occur. What we do when we prescribe burn is we do a fuels analysis and write a burn plan, put in fire lines or hose, sprinklers. We have to get a permit to burn and also get smoke approval on the day of the burn. The prescribed fire is burning up a lot of fine fuels and fuels that have accumulated on the forest floor over the last 100 years or so when the last fire occurred. 
we conducted a prescribed burn in the spring of 2014 and we've done some thinning in there too. And in the August of 2015, fire came into the area that we had prescribed burn. I uh, knew that it would definitely have an effect on fire behavior, but I was quite taken aback by how the wildfire stopped right on the fire line that uh, was used during the controlled burn. The fire in other areas crossed into the area that had been previously prescribed burn, but the fire behavior was very subdued. We do need to bring prescribed fire back into the toolbox. In order to do that, we're going to need public support from people that understand that fire is an integral part of habitat management. No fire is not an option, but if we have more prescribed fire, we're going to have less severe and more controllable wildfire. In Washington State, where I come from, we are prescribed burning, but at nowhere near the scale of the need. Currently, six to seven times as many acres are burned by wildfires as by prescribed fires, and that's the thing we need to flip around. In eastern Washington, for example, it's likely that about half of our landscape would benefit from some sort of fuel treatment to change wildfire behavior. But we have some issues in the big. We have high costs, poor access, unrealistic smoke management goals, and a lack of social license to increase the footprint of prescribed burning to much cover much larger areas. Taken together, these are all substantial limiting factors. Prescribed burning in our rangelands is also a big need. I don't know if you know this or not, but currently about two-thirds of the lands that are burning in these western megafires are actually in rangelands. In many years, we have the opportunity to strategically burn or to graze the flashy fuels around our communities and around high-value wildlife assets or recreation assets to protect them before the wildfire season. But most, of the time, most of the time, we simply don't do it or we don't do it enough. Imagine a burning and a grazing plan that strategically distributed spring or fall treated areas these would be extremely helpful to firefighters during the summer wildfires. They'd use the treated areas as containers to steer fires into, to keep fires small from the start. The greatest barrier to prescribed burning is what? Smoke. The smoke it produces. We don't like it. We don't want it. We want it to go away. But the smoke from prescribed burning each year and each decade adds up to so much less than that occurring from wildfires. It's not close. Mm -hmm. This is a John Marshall repeat photo showing a prescribed burn in a wildfire. In the top, you can see prescribed burning smoke in the Wenatchee Valley. It lasted about a day and a half. In the bottom, you can see smoke from the Wenatchee, 2012 Wenatchee complex. That smoke lasted for 30 days, and it was 10 times more smoke, especially of the 2.5 emissions that we're all worried about. The problem is that wildfire smoke gets a pass. It's not counted, it's not regulated, it's considered unavoidable sort of act of God stuff. But that's in fact nonsense. To a large degree, it's avoidable, we can reduce it, we co-created these conditions. Prescribed burning smoke, on the other hand, is regulated as an avoidable nuisance. Why? Because we strike the match. But smoke is smoke, right? And you'd think the best human health and forest management alternative might provide the least amount of smoke. It doesn't work that way right now. Most days, managers in my part of the world and yours who are ready to burn, do prescribed burning, they can't under current smoke management conditions. They don't get enough permitted acres. We all need to work together to get this change. <laughs> Hopefully it's clear by now that Smokey's message needs a little tune-up. You can't say it all in one sentence anymore. That's his personal drip torch. Another tool in the toolbox for creating these wildfire resilient landscapes is mechanical thinning. Where does it fit into all of this? Let's face it, 20th century logging made a lot of us gun shy of any sort of timber harvesting. We saw those big trucks of yellow bellies going down the road, didn't we? 
But I'd like to suggest that in many ways we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Things have really changed. We're using smaller trees. Utilization standards are better. And if fires aren't thinning the forest and burning up fuels, fuels and trees increase, and that's the current predicament. So I'd like to suggest we might ask a better question today. Are we now able to harvest in ways that are profitable and good for the health and the resilience of the forest going forward? Well, we think so. Take a look. I've come to believe we do need some active management out there on the landscape. If the forest is homogenous, the fires do have an easier time burning more severely in those cases. We do need the timber industry to make our forest more resilient. If there are lots of trees on the landscape, we can go in and thin those trees to an appropriate spacing where the forest can handle regular intervals of fire and can handle insect and disease coming through and it can be resilient to all those things. So when fire does come through, it behaves like it did here. It behaved in a way that was safe for the firefighters. They could manage this fire, and it's actually beneficial for the landscape. When we leave here, the forest that's left is higher value than when we found it. And then we can take those byproducts to the marketplace, and we're able to carve out a, a nice business in a rural community. We did some treatment, and that created small logs, which we put on a truck and shipped to the mill. Once we get it to the mill, we turn them into two by fours. The byproduct of that activity is chips, sawdust, shavings, and bark. Those products all have a destination, whether that be chip wood to go to the pulp and paper plant or biomass to go to the power facilities. All kinds of wood products that you don't think about every day, but they come from these small diameter trees that come from treatments like here at this forest. I think some of our biggest allies now are environmentalists. We used to protest against old growth logging. I've come around to believing that we do need the timber industry and the infrastructure. And there's evidence that thinning followed by prescribed fire, which can be controlled, definitely results in less severe fires. When I talk to people who are very concerned about any tree cutting in the national forest. They've seen the big clear cuts of the past. They've been convinced that logging is bad. And I emphasize, we're not thinning every acre of the forest. We're gonna focus on the areas that might burn the hottest. We're gonna focus on the areas closer to communities. The right thing to do out in our public forest is to apply science, utilize a timber industry that can take small diameter trees, take strict conservation measures, and get to work on a landscape level of restoring our forest. Sometimes folks will ask me the question, well then why can't we mechanically thin an entire forest? In a lot of areas it's just not appropriate. And that's the case in north central Washington where I live, where three out of four million acres is in wilderness or roadless or it's in a national park. Thinning isn't appropriate there, and it's not consistent with the legislation that made it a wilderness or a park. Where it is appropriate, though, we have some issues. We have adequate commercial volume issues, road access issues, and most of all, most of our mills have closed down. We lack mill infrastructure, and it's difficult to site a small log sawmill without some promise of a stable supply. I'd like to suggest what is needed is new social license to do the right kind of thinning work, apply the right tools in the right places, and to rebuild some of that long-term mill infrastructure where it's needed. Managed wildfire is a third great tool for creating these resilient landscapes, and it's grossly underused. Managing a wildfire means that fire managers herd naturally ignited wildfires across the landscape, and they use these fires to thin forests and consume fuels when the weather conditions and the fuel conditions allow. But in order to work well, there can't be too much fuel, the forest can't be too dense in layers, otherwise fire behavior will be extreme or at worst unpredictable. And as communities were afraid to use managed wildfire, 
because we worry that one or two will get away. And one or two will get away. The weather can turn unpredictably, but far fewer acres will be burned and homes destroyed than by those two to five percent of wildfires that we currently simply can't contain. The choice is clear. We need to use more managed wildfire. A great example of a managed wildfire is this one. It was the 16 Buck Creek Fire on the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest. Lightning ignited this fire in wilderness and firefighters herded it away from public inholdings into forests that needed thinning and fuel reduction. This is a fire progression map. Hot colors are severe, cool colors are less severe. A beautiful managed wildfire. Now the next time a fire moves through this area, it's going to burn less severely because fuels have been reduced. And this is the kind of managed wildfire we need to be doing lots more of. The problem with our current landscape is that the scale of the need is large and the time is short. Just using a map of Oregon and Washington alone, 12 million acres in this red area need some sort of intentional treatment to restore better fire behavior in forest age conditions. That's about 40 to 50 percent of that area. This is a published study jointly conducted by uh, Pacific Northwest Region, the Nature Conservancy, and Forest Service Research and Development. The need is large, and having a large toolkit will be extremely useful. Furthermore, it's likely we don't have 20 years left to get the needed work done. And this prompts me to have that conversation with you. Our climate predictions are telling us that the burned area since 2000 will at least double or triple in the next 30 years. Some forecasts say more. As I mentioned before, we've currently put out at least 95% of the total wildfire starts. Well, many of these burn under moderating conditions, and we can actually put them back to work as managed wildfires. Think about prescribed burning and, and thinning as being especially useful where we need certainty about perimeter control and we really need to nail the fire behavior. Now, the second leg of this cohesive strategy is to build wildfire resilient communities. Homeowners, neighborhoods, municipalities all need to work together to get prepared for these coming wildfires. And that means we fireproof our homes, our yards, and our businesses. And we change our fire preparedness in our way. Most homeowners and neighborhoods in my home, Wenatchee Valley, they're unprepared and their houses and yards will burn. And that's motivating hundreds of families each year to get their work done. It's looking good. We all need to clearly focus on where we're going to build and what we're going to build with. Discussions are underway in Wenatchee and in the surrounding county for adopting the national and international WUI building code, not only in our new developments, but also in our established developments. <clears throat> this is a big, big step. And it takes our communities to not only get better educated about our risks and our liabilities, but then us taking the political initiative to say we're going to adopt it wall to wall. We need to take a hard look at our homes and our neighborhoods and make some really badly needed changes to roofing materials and decks and landscaping materials where we put the firewood, the juniper under the bay windows. Gotta go. <laughs> that cedar shake roof is lovely but it's going to burn your house down. All of these things have a significant impact on how our house and yard will respond to a wildfire. And the key is going to be to work together to get this needed work done. Conservation districts, for example, are coordinating a lot of efforts. In Washington, they're providing chipping and biomass disposal for residents who are willing to roll up their sleeves, thin out their trees and shrubs. In fact, there are a lot of resources available for each of us. A lot of them you can visit tonight on tables out there. If you haven't looked up Fire Adapted Communities or Firewise.org, you really should. Let's go visit some friends of mine, Mike and Sarah Rawls. They own an 80-acre patch of forest south of Wenatchee, and they're getting busy and ready for the fires. We've lived at our property for about 12 years now. 
and it was not maintained. The last natural forest fire that's been through there was from 1918, I think I had a forester tell us. Um, so nothing has been done other than some harvesting of trees for firewood. With the density and the disease and the spindliness and the unhealthiness of the forest, it is just um, ready to create an inferno. One little spark out there and the whole thing would go up and we'd lose everything that we love about being out there. So we really felt at risk. And then it also becomes a matter of responsibility and being a good steward of the land, not just for our own safety and our neighbor's safety, but for the wildlife and the habitat in general. It's really not a matter of if, it's a matter of when a fire's gonna come through. So while Mike and I have been chipping away at trying to, to mitigate the unhealthy forest over the last 12 years, we've decided that we really want to just take care of it. And so we contacted a forester who developed a forest management plan for us. And in the forest management plan, it prescribes any sort of um, danger areas that need treatment per se, or things that can be areas that can be left alone. And from that, we became aware of some cost share grants via Cascadia Conservation District, the DNR, and NRCS. And then we've hired a commercial crew to come out there and take care of it. We kind of took a look around our property and realized that while we have a pretty good defensible space, the house itself really wasn't that fire safe. And so we decided that we needed to do something about that. And so we had a FireWise type assessor to do a home assessment for us. Hi. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Annie. So I'll just sort of do a 360 around the house, and I'm going to look at the house starting at the foundation and moving to the top of the roof. And Annie was able to point out some really specific things that were really easy and tangible to do, not very expensive, and were able to complete uh, pretty quickly. Oh, see, these are the vents that I talked about. Those soft vents. We want those to be a good repair. Um, we want to make sure they're not exposed. Um, material. I can tell you when I walk out there, I just have this sense of relief. Not only is it beautiful, and I wish I'd done this like 12 years ago when we first got the property, but the risk is just, I mean, I guess I didn't realize that I was living with this heightened state of fear of what was going to happen. I feel so much safer and responsible for taking care of the land that we decided to purchase. The third and final leg of that cohesive strategy is to maintain a safe and effective wildfire response. As you know, we have the best supplied and the best trained suppression workforce anywhere in the world right here in the U.S. The trouble is, no matter how well we fight fire, some are simply uncontrollable. They burn under these hot, dry, windy conditions, and we can't put firefighters in front of those fires. To recall, I said that the Forest Service and partner agencies, they put out 95 to 98% of fires every year in this country, wall to wall, which is an amazing statistic. Unfortunately, it's the uncontrollable 2 to 5% that are causing all the damage and cost to contain. The simple fact is that fire suppression alone, it's an incomplete solution. And what's needed is a cultural shift by you and me from being purely reactive about fire to being primarily proactive about fire. When we make our landscapes and our communities fire resilient, we give firefighters for the first time the best chance of stopping wildfires before they can destroy our communities. And this also gives them added flexibility to allow some of these wildfires to burn when the fuel and the fire weather conditions are more moderate. As you probably gathered, described a social problem. It has ecological and climate explanations, but it's a social problem. And it's going to take all of us to solve it. It's not just up to public land managers and firefighters. It's on us, too. Public support for using these tools is poor. We simply want fires to go away somehow magically, don't we? And take that pesky smoke with them. <laughs> But there's no future without lots of fire and smoke in it. That option's just not on the table. Until we, the co-owners of public lands, claim that it's our high priority to take the initiative, 
We're on a path to continued losses like we've seen. It's up to us. We can spread this message to our lawmakers at all levels, folks who can change the way we manage our forests and our fires. It's up to us to take responsibility for our property, our neighborhoods, our towns, our wildland urban interface, and our building codes. Simple solutions are going to be offered to thin all the forests, or to just use managed wildfire, or just use prescribed burning. But these are all oversimplifications. We're going to need all the tools and your good minds and your best efforts to help determine both ecologically and socially appropriate mixes according to the landscape we have in front of us. I want to leave you with a couple of questions to ponder. How do you want your fire going forward? Do you want it? Measured or wild and unpredictable? How do you want your smoke meted out in small or belching in large and unbridled doses? How do you want your forests green and growing or black and gone? And how fire safe do you want your communities to be? Here today and tomorrow? It's up to all of us. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Well, thanks for everybody for coming out and learning a little bit more about the challenges facing all of us. Paul's available for some questions. If anybody has any, you could pass the microphone around. I'm glad that you mentioned uh, climate change and uh, global warming, I think, is our, is our primary problem. And my understanding is that forests um, are, are expert at, at getting carbon out of the atmosphere and it's that carbon that is causing global warming and of course the carbon comes from uh, a lot of human causes so i'm wondering if we're missing the real the, the primary problem is the climate and the carbon uh, that's making the climate warm up um, and, and the forest, which collects carbon through photosynthesis. So I don't think we're hitting the, the primary cause. I disagree. I think there's a couple of ideas that, that are really important. So climate change is really important because it's fueling larger fires. And larger fire, fires are going to keep getting larger. In my lab, we've reconstructed about 400 landscapes across the West, and we found out that forest area has increased really significantly, and the density of forests and the layering of forest has increased. So we know that a warming climate that's forcing more severe fire behavior added with fuels, more fuels, is a deadly combo. And here's the meanest idea associated with the carbon question. Our carbon sequestration calculations right now are not considering how do we grow forests with their native fire regime. We're essentially thinking about how much forest we can grow to sequester carbon in above ground live trees. But we can't store the amount of carbon that we're storing right now with the fire regime being a part of it. So sustainable carbon storage is a much different figure than the one we're counting on. Okay. There's no way to separate forest growth and forest sustainability from the wildfire regime, and that's the key message. Our carbon storage has to be in the context of its wildfire regime. I'm, I'm really intrigued by everything you said, and my wife and I have owned forest and land for, I don't know, 30 years. And uh, what I'm curious about is whether 
you've introduced your ideas to insurance companies that insure homes and forested land, and, and what might they have said if you have? That's a great question. We're actually working pretty closely with insurance companies right now because you know they have a stake in the big game, don't they? So places like Fort uh, McMurray, there was a several hundred million dollar egg, insurance egg, that was not covered by insurance premiums that were collected because so many homes were destroyed simultaneously. And the more and more that happens, the more the insurance industry is basically saying, hmm, we should probably be thinking about fire danger zoning. And we should be thinking about rating homeowners in, uh, in terms of uh, how prepared they are for fires and incentivize getting prepared. And those are the conversations that are going on. And my guess is that it's going to be insurance companies in the next 10 years that will be the tail that wags the dog. It's a great question. They are so into it right now, and they've got really good people working on the problem. On that note, is there any consideration of perhaps not rebuilding as many homes as were there that were destroyed in those type of areas? Like in the flood situation and in uh, Katrina and that sort of thing? Is that, is that something that's happening? It is, uh, but it's, it's taking a long time to, to percolate through the system because the insurance industry doesn't want to be punitive. What they really want to do is incentivize people being smart and being more clever. They want to incentivize communities becoming more clever about where they're going to build and not build. And there's new science coming out on how to even develop a new development so it's more fire safe. So they're trying to have that stuff percolate. They're working with communities to basically say, choose the more clever stuff. It's to your advantage financially as a community, as a municipality. Uh, I actually see them trying to work in a really positive way rather than a punitive way. But I think in the final analysis, they're going to say to municipalities, if you get really expensive to insure, we're either not going to insure you or we're going to charge you the full freight for it. So I think us being smart is the way to go. Uh, yes, my question now on this is, uh, there was one point in the, in the presentation about animals on the land. I know with these, with these monuments, they're taking the cattle out, yet it's been known for years that animals on the, in the forest does a world of good. Is there any work with the federal government on letting these animals get back in, these ranchers get back in, on bigger squats, or not? Like, so livestock grazing uh, in the old days was the most harmful ever. But livestock grazing, basically the art and science of doing it has really evolved tremendously. And in fact, grazing herbivory actually can be a really good thing. Grazing right now is not so much an ecological problem, it's a social problem. Like wildfire, a lot of people just don't like it on public lands. And so it's another one of those issues where people need to start working together with the grazers to basically say, you know, maybe this is it's a powerful tool. We can actually use livestock grazing, sheep, cattle, and goats to help out with building these containers on the landscape. And we have grazers who can follow the green up right now and do range riding, so we can actually do grazing like never before, and it's happening throughout the West. But we actually have a social attitude that's adverse to grazing. People remember what grazing did to the land, and so like timber harvesting of old, people have an attitude about grazing. But it can be a really important part of the equation. So we need to make it so. It's a great tool in the toolkit. And I think people have to basically, in communities, ask the question, what's going to be the role for grazing here? How are we going to use it intelligently? It's a great question. I'm a taxpayer in western New York. How do you persuade me? Sorry. You know, <laughs> how do you persuade people who live in the eastern part of the country that this is officially important to them to want to pay taxes, federal taxes, to these kinds to solve these kinds of problems. So let me uh, let me ask a question. First of all, is there a realtor in the house that can help this guy get a place on? <laughs> <laughs> really, I'm sorry. Um, so let me return with a question. You said we have almost 200 million acres of public lands. We have the coolest experiment going on in the United States. 
with parks and wilderness and forests that we can play and recreate in. Why wouldn't it be to your advantage to make sure that this was a legacy that you passed on? And why wouldn't you demand this for your kids and their kids? That's why I come out here. <laughs> All right, so you're just baiting me. Stop that. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Really good. Um, so my question is related back to the price of prescribed burning. Mm -hmm. And I know that oftentimes there is a high high cost associated with prescribed burning, especially at the intervals that you need to do it, mm -hmm. to be able to maintain that effect that you want on the landscape from the prescribed burn. Um, and one thing that, that I would suggest and I'd like to get your feedback on is that uh, you know, you, you discussed uh, timber harvesting and mechanical treatments to be able to do more work and get more of that uh, resilience back into the landscape, create more patchy uh, areas, and uh, through doing that, that can create receipts that help pay for the prescribed burning. Um, how do you feel we can increase the amount of money that comes into the agencies to do more prescribed burning, uh, maybe with timber harvesting, or do you have any other uh, things that you think could be done. So we have some acres that are commercially viable. We can cover the base rates and actually uh, produce some net value from a commercial entry. We have a lot of acres that are not commercially viable. In fact, there are probably more acres that aren't commercially viable than are commercially viable. The question about uh, prescribed burning costs, the front end cost for the first entry per acre is usually the highest cost you'll have. But then burning every three to five years, that cost steadily goes down. And burning states like Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, and Florida, all the way to Texas, who've been burning that, that per acre annual cost or every three year cost, it goes down, 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 and it's more cost effective to do the burning at cost than not doing the burning and losing the, the forest to wildfires. So they're actually putting in the front end cost. So when you stop and think about the values that you're protecting, the values that are at risk, I would say that investment is important to make. Front end costs are going to be high. And for most of the acres that we have to treat that haven't been prescribed burned, the per acre costs are going to be the highest on the front but they steadily go down as you are doing the maintenance burning. Other questions? Yeah. I, I appreciate the fact that you have been calling this phenomenon less a natural disaster than a human-induced disaster. It seems to me for a long time we've been using the term natural disaster in a way that takes the responsibility away from us. Putting this in, in the context of a human-induced disaster makes it much more real, I think, to us. But, but the elephant in that room is we have a Congress which is largely occupied by individuals who reject the science of global warming and climate change. Same thing is true for the White House. Do you have, have you had any luck in per persuading representatives in, from the Western states who are living in this human-induced disaster regime, that climate change is what's driving the problem and will so into the future. So you laid out a lot of steam and piles that I could step in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first thing first, um, I wouldn't call it a disaster. It's a, it's a problem of our own creation. But I'm frankly tired of the disaster speak and the catastrophe speak. I look at wildfires all across the West, and there are so many acres, half of them often, that actually the touch of fire did a pretty good or better job. So first thing I would say is we stop the catastrophe speak about wildfires, and we actually evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis. The second thing is uh, it's, it's a tough sell if a public land manager or a scientist is trying to make that case, but you all hire and fire lawmakers at every single level, and that's where the power lives. And so if you think it's important that things that are done, it's actually up to you to be able to work with your representative to say, I'm not okay with the deal I'm getting. 
It's up to you. Have you ever told you that before? <laughs> yes? Um, I work in the outdoor industry, and I'd say over the last five years, uh, there's been a lot of proactivity around ecology, and your message particularly would be very pointed in that industry. Have you reached out to the outdoor industry? And same thing, I think about um, the lumber or logging industry. So if you have large economic blocks that would also influence lawmakers. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic question we actually have. I've been working with outdoor writers and journalists to try to, to um, produce stories that are compelling for um, ski magazine, mountain biking, and backpacking magazines mm -hmm. about the forest that they love and like to recreate in. I'm a, I'm a research scientist, and, and my mission is to make new knowledge widgets and to get them out there. And um, I'm really stretching myself to do what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. What really needs to happen by people who are in the outdoor industry, for example, is to do something about what they heard and to affect the networks that they put a touch on. I think it's really important. Again, it's one of those things where if you're in the mountain biking world and this message hasn't penetrated, help it penetrate. We have destination mountain biking areas that are going up in flames. Is that okay? If not, do something about it. Get involved. And so forth. So I guess on that same note, thank you for being here doing this. I hope all of us leave and talk about it in the next days. So I have two questions. How long does it take to change society and to change our public attitude? And do we have that much time? There's not a big scene on that. It was too big, I guess. Some of them do. Um, yeah, I, I have to count on optimism. I really do. I have to count on us. Um, the whole reason I'm doing this is when I think about, uh, we live in a participatory democracy, right? And public land management is the coolest experiment in participatory democracy I can even think of. And yet we're not participating. We're not involved. And I believe that if we got involved and we protected and loved the assets that have been given to us, we can really make a difference. We're just not doing it yet. So the reason why we're going to communities is to try to tell you about this amazing thing we have and that we have the opportunity to do something about it. I have to count on the fact that we can if we have the volition, if we have the will to engage. But it's going to take us to get up out of our chairs and, and to become involved and to work in our communities to create a different future in our community where we live. You don't have to change the world, but you can change your corner of it, and that's the start. Well, I think we got time for one more. Yeah, yeah no, no pressure. <laughs> Dr. Hesburgh, my name is Merv George, and I'm the Forest Supervisor here at the Road River Siskiyou National Forest. And I want to say thank you very much for your presentation tonight. You're welcome. There were lots of points of it that I really appreciated, especially the part um, of the Native American participation and management long before European settlements. Um, that's a story that I've been telling throughout my career with the Forest Service since I am an enrolled member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe, just on the other side of the mountains. Um, one of the things that I wanted to share with everyone in the room is you do have an opportunity to participate and have your voice be heard. When our forest does projects that are doing fuels reduction, we normally hear from people who are paid to not want to see anything done in our, in our woods. It would be really nice to see some support letters from you all who are concerned, who want to advance some of this fuels reduction so that we can get back to a fire adapted community. So we have several projects that are happening on the forest, and I would love to hear from each and every one of you um, and see your direct support of that. And we'll make sure that when we're reaching out during our NEPA process and the public engagement process, that there will be plenty of opportunities for your voice to get in the room. 
Um, you know, as a person who has been a manager of large fires for many years, including the largest fire in California history, which was the Thomas Fire, which ironically was in the month of December, just this past December. 291,000 acres burned near Santa Barbara, California in December. And I have 8,500 firefighters that were working for me. And we spent $200 million of taxpayers' money in December. So when people talk about normal fire seasons, those days are gone. And so as a student of fire, Dr. Hesper, I'm going to be in direct contact with you very soon so that I can learn more about what the science is saying so that we can directly get that information right onto the ground. So again, I, I'm really glad that I showed up tonight. And I look forward to working with everybody in the room to keep you all safe or safer. And hopefully our paths cross again. So thank you. Thanks. So I want to I want to tell you a story, um, and then we'll close. Is that okay? Or you got a gap? What county is? <laughs> so you heard Dale Swigert talk about prescribed fire councils uh, in the east and in the south. Georgia burned a million acres last year prescribed burning. The North and South Carolina burned four or five hundred thousand acres a year. And their wildfire acres are very small by comparison because they're doing it. And the story I want to tell you is about my folks. My folks are 90. They live in Florida. And they, uh, half the year, they, they winter down there. And when prescribed burning started with the prescribed burning councils 45 years ago, everybody was up in arms. If you think about it, everybody who has gray hair and a pension goes to Florida to be able to winter, right? <laughs> and you know, they look up from their bridge hand and they go, oh, that's going to be gone. And now, when there's a smoke somewhere and they're doing some burning, they'll go, oh, yeah, they're burning over by Oki Finoki, uh, or no Trump. And they don't even break stride anymore because they become, in 40 years, a culture of burning. And they burn hundreds of thousands of acres a year because people said, let's try this, let's do it. And then they did it. And so Florida is a state of burners again, and Georgia, and North Carolina, and South Carolina, and so forth. Because they decided, and then they did it. And that, I think, is the answer to your question. You just have to do it. And we've got people we can talk to who have been successful. They've already blazed the trail. Let's talk to them. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention and your great questions. Representative.